자, 그 크리스 얘기 했던 것처럼 이제 올해는 미국 주식이 떨어질 수 있는데 말한 것처럼 생산성이 강하면 무조건 떨어지는 거 아니야? 어, 오를 수 있어. So who is this guy? 대출이 많은 거 어렵다. 어렵다. How old is he? Seventeen. Am I right? Same age as your grandmother? No, my Who looks better? He looks better. Usually, Korean people look better than Western people, right? Western people get a lot. My wife is complaining about my wrinkles, <laughs> losing hair, losing hair. Right? Korean people have good skin. Western people don't have good skin, right? Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Okay. I see all on your your white book. Wanting your skin? Yes, she bought me some cream and I don't use, but she gets annoyed. You put your face skin. Face cream? Yeah, cream. I should do, but I don't. Uh, I forget. <laughs> I don't have to look at my own face. I don't mind. It's probably for my wife. She has to see my face. So she is the. Take care of those things, right? <laughs> Did you know that if you get married someday, it's like having a pet husband. You have to look after like a pet. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> no? yeah. Do all those things like put on the cream or those things. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Korean men are different. Are Korean men different? Very tidy and use the cream, take good care of themselves? Some <laughs> people. Huh? I think so. I think generally, Korean men is cleaner and more personal hygiene than Western guys. Find here. So cultural difference. My wife, maybe she shouldn't have married a foreigner. It's her, it's her own fault. She should have thought about that first. Could marry some very clean Korean guy with good personal hygiene. Used to living in a small apartment, right? I think that's one reason. If you live in a small apartment, you have to be very tidy. Right? So anyway, uh, Warren Buffet, here he is. Um, he is a very successful investor in the world, most successful investor, more billionaire, just from investing in the stock market. So a lot of people want to hear what he has to say, right? So he made a bet with a million dollar bet. Right? We are currently in the seventh year. He made a 10 year bet. He bet that over 10 years, the S&P 500 would outperform some hedge funds or managed funds. Okay? So under the terms, he bet on the performance of an S&P index fund, and a money manager bet on five of his own funds, which nobody knows, right? So the money manager bet, I'm going to do better than the S&P. Seven years are up and the S&P is up 63.3%, right? That's going to be in seven years, five or six percent a year, right? Then cumulatively. The other funds are only up 20%, the managed funds, right? We talked about transaction cost, okay? And probably the money manager made a bad decision about which companies to invest in, okay? So in the end, they would pay one million to the charity, okay? So it looks like at this stage that uh, Warren Buffet is going to win the bet, the million dollar bet. That was a famous bet in the financial industry, showing about the usefulness of ETF. Because the money manager, you're going to have to pay them 2 or 3 percent, and the ETF, you only have to pay less than 1 percent. Okay? So, let's return then to the, we're talking about the bonds. So, we can have different types of bonds. Uh, we, we're going to look at the different types. So the first, do, you, do you like vanilla ice cream? Yes. Vanilla is no flavor, just a normal one, right? This is called straight big step, okay? It has a specified coupon rate and maturity and no options attached. This is a normal bond. So, we looked at, I think before, coupon. So I'm, I'm a company, let's say I'm Deutsche Telekom, right? 
and I, 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 want, I have a 1 million bond. Okay? So this has 10 years, it lasts for 10 years, and then we can add a coupon. Coupon of 2% a year. So this coupon is basically talking about it, like interest. You're going to get 2% every year. Okay? How much is 2% of 1 million? 20,000. So what's happened is that probably you're not going to have the bond in your hand. You're going to buy the bond and leave it in your bank. Okay? There's going to be a bank account set up. Deutsche Bank will deposit $20,000 into your account every year. Do you understand? Yes. So you get this coupon of 2% a year. At the end of the 10 years, Deutsche Bank will deposit $1 million into your account. Okay? Do you understand? Maybe you will say, it's okay, I don't need the million dollars, let's roll over. Roll over means keep going. Okay, another 10 years. Very often happens. Okay? But uh, then we decide how much will I pay for this bond today. Okay? But most bonds are like this. They have a specified coupon rate, 2%, 3%, and a maturity, 10%. Okay? Coupon dates are usually annual, the end of the year. The vast majority of international bonds are like this. This is the vast majority of bonds. They look like that. <clears throat> then we have a floating rate notes. So this is like a lot of people for their mortgage, they can choose like this, fixed rate or floating rate. Right? Gojong, go, go jong or go jong is fixed rate. What's floating rate? Byung, 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 so most people in Korea, maybe 85% have Pyongyang rates for their mortgage. That is based on the, uh, this is called LIBOR. Okay, this is the interbank offered rate. This is the interest rate one bank charges another. But it, it's, it's based on the central bank sets the deposit rate, right? So the central bank changed the rate, then the Pyongyang Gongli change, right? Goes up or goes down. So we can also have a bond like this, okay? If the interest rate in London, the LIBOR, goes up, then uh, our one also goes up. The coupon will go up. Do you understand? Flexible rate? Yes. That's the second one. It depends on the kind of the world interest rate. <coughs> Floating rate. Then we have an equity related bond which is convertible bonds and bonds with equity warrant. So a convertible bond allows the investor to exchange the bond for a number of shares in the future. So we can see this is an advantage because the bond price doesn't go up, but the share price might go up. So if we have the option to convert our bond to equity, then uh, that's better. So we have to pay a premium. If we can convert our bond to equity later, we have to pay extra money, okay? And lower interest. We get lower interest and we pay more money for this convertible bond. Okay, bonds with equity warrant. It means instead of converting my bond to equity, I keep my bond, but I have an option to buy some shares in the firm, okay, in the future. So this is for people who also want to get an advantage from the increasing stock price. Okay. Zero coupon bonds is uh, very simply coupon. How much is this, the coupon going to be in the zero coupon bond? Zero. Zero, very good. <laughs> right? It's easier to figure out the price of a zero coupon bond. Right? You don't get any coupon, so I'm going to get a million dollars in 10 years, how much is that worth today? Million. Would you pay a million dollars today to get a million dollars in 10 years? You're thinking about it? Maybe? Something changed. Deflation? Yes. It's an unusual situation, right? Maybe in Japan or Switzerland, but it's not likely. Okay? So, <coughs> that's a zero coupon bond. They're sold at a large discount from face value because there is no cash flow. 
So the prices of the bond is going to be quite low. Okay, discount means lower price. Uh, dual currency bond. You can make a fixed rate bond for Korean currency, and the interest is paid in US dollars. Okay? So Japanese firms have been big issuers. The coupons is in yen and the principal is in dollar. Okay. So we can have principal is the money you get back at the end. You start with dollars and you end with dollars. But you might be living in Japan. So you prefer to get yen as your coupon payment instead of having to change dollars every year. Okay. Also a good option for a multinational corporation financing a foreign subsidiary. Okay, so we can get the payment in the local currency, or we can pay the interest in the local currency. So we can get some composite bonds, is uh, not very common. So we can see, we can compare them here. Okay, fixed rate bonds, every year we get a coupon, the size of the coupon is fixed. 2% or 3% doesn't change, pay off in the same currency. Floating, we get paid the interest every 3 or 6 months, the interest rate changes. Okay. Convertible bond, uh, we can get the money back or we can convert to shares at the end. Uh, this one, we get our money back plus option to buy shares. Uh, this one here, zero, there's no interest payment, no coupon payment, okay? Just we get the money back at the end. And the dual currency, we get the interest payment in a different currency. So do you have any question about the different type of bond company can sell? Why, why main zero coupon? Zero coupon. Maybe the company doesn't want to pay interest every year. Right? They don't want to pay interest every year, so they just want to pay everything at the end. Okay, maybe they don't have a big cash flow, they're not expecting to get a big cash flow. That kind of thing, right? So, different reasons. Maybe they just want to be more easy to find the price. Easier to find the price. Okay, so any other question? Is the company make the zero coupon? Yes, they do, but this one is by far the most common one. Okay, zero coupon bond is not that common. But for the short time period, it's more common zero coupon. Like one year bond is zero coupon, right? Uh, two year bond could also be zero coupon. But longer bond, less likely to be zero coupon. <coughs> so. This is the top of all the bonds still to be paid off. We can see that the euro is getting more popular than the dollar. 2003, 2004, 2007, euros are being used more than dollars. Is the trend? Okay. Uh, who is offering bonds? Banks. Banks are selling bonds. Right? One of, if a bank sells a bond, then it can lend the money to you. Okay? Problem in Ireland during the financial crisis. Here's Germany. Here's Ireland. Before the crisis, Irish people have to spend, 10, before the euro, they have to spend 10% to get a loan. After the euro, the Irish banks sell their bonds to Germany, investors. Okay, sell bonds to German investors. German investors want to buy the bonds now because it's in euros. Okay, do you understand? Before the bond was in Irish pounds, they weren't sure. But now the bond is in euro, they have no exchange rate risk. So the Irish banks sell the bonds to the German investors, right? What do the Irish banks do with the money? Have a big party? Give loans. They had parties too, but one of my friends worked in the bank every weekend. They gave him the company credit cards, drink all he wants with all his friends, right? They had trips to the Netherlands to play in football competitions. <laughs> so they, they also had a lot of parties. Our finance minister famously said before the IMF came, 
We all partied. <laughs> but he got into a lot of trouble because some people didn't party. So some people partied and some people didn't party. But the country went bankrupt in the end. They left the banks, right? Who, who was the fault? German investors or the Irish people? Hmm? Both of them, right? So anyway, the German investors bought the bond from the bank. The bank gave really silly loans. My friend told me, because he was working in the bank, he went into the middle of the countryside. One guy wanted the loan for $10 million to build a supermarket in the middle of the countryside. Right? Like Lotte, a Lotte department store in the middle of Gangwondo, middle of nowhere. Right? And my friend said he didn't want to give the loan. But his boss told him, you have to give the loan, give the loan. We got lots of money from the Germans, right? Give him the loan. <laughs> it's OK. So he gave him a loan, $10 million to build a lot of department store, right? In the middle of the countryside. So then, of course, he couldn't pay back the loan. Then the bank went bankrupt, right? Then the Irish government was really silly. They decided to save the banks. Then the Irish government went bankrupt. The IMF came, right? Do you see the story? So I start by this kind of thing. The financial institution issue bonds. They sell the bonds to investors. They get the money. And they lend the money to the people, right? But well, hopefully the financial institutions do a better job than the Irish financial institutions, right? Of lending the money to the people. Okay. Then the next biggest lender of money is governments. And just like this, Ireland's bank we're about 700 times bigger than our government. Or, or, sorry, not 700, seven times bigger than the government, right? Then we have uh, international corporate issuers, okay, and total. So we can see that companies are not the main issuers, issuers of bonds. We have governments and banks are the main, governments, banks, and corporations, right? Together. So banks is the main issuer of bonds. Then the bank lends the money. It's like a middleman, right? The bank lends the money to companies later, right? Or the bank lends the money to individuals, right? Anyway, the banks are helping. If the company or the government wants to sell bonds, the bank is going to help them to sell the bonds, investment bank. <clears throat> so these companies sell the credit rating analysis. They focus on default risk, not exchange rate risk. Okay? So we talked about the problem with bonds is they can be defaulted. Okay? So at this time, uh, Moody's rating for the Irish banks, AAA, -A -A -A, right? So German investors look at the Moody's rating. They don't know what's happening here, right? My friend knows what hap what's happening, I know what's happening. But the German investor don't know what's happening. Do they have the time to find out all that information? No. Investigate? No. No, they don't. Who do they trust? Moody's. They trust the credit rating agencies to do that, right? Who pays the credit rating agencies? No. The investor or the banks? Bank. Banks. Can you see a problem? <laughs> yes. Right? The banks pay the credit rating agencies to give them a rating. Okay? So the credit rating agency decides to give the Irish banks an AA rating. Then they go to China, they give them E rating. Really bad, right? <laughs> But the Chinese banks, no problem, okay, one year later. So a lot of people criticized the rating agency, okay? They made, of course they made mistakes in the past, but generally people trust, still trust them because they have people who has uh, quite good education working there, smart people, and generally they do good research, okay? They can make mistakes, they're just human, they can make mistakes, but Generally, they do good research. So these guys sell the credit rating analysis to companies. Companies buy that. Do you think you can sell a bond if you don't have a rating aid from the rating agency? It's going to be easy to sell your bond or hard to sell your bond? So let's say you're an Irish bank. You don't have any rating. German investors are not going to buy your bond, right? The only reason they're buying this bond, it has an AAA rating from Moody's, okay? They think it's really safe. <coughs> So, these, they assess the country, they look at political risk and economic risk. So, how is the bond market structured? So, the primary market is very similar to US underwriting. 
So one group is going to tell us about that in their final project, right? But we can also learn about underwriting. I put this link on the Geishi Pan. Okay? This is investment banking and secondary markets from Yale. So number three, number four, and number five. What is investment banking historically? Investment banking's underwriting process. The investment banker is a manager of a security. It has a transcript here, a subtitle. Okay, you can watch the video on YouTube with Robert Schiller. But briefly I explained in the last class, and I'll just summarize again what happens, right? So a borrower decides to raise funds. We start with the borrower decides to raise funds, right? So I'm a company, and I'm an Irish bank, and I want to get more money, right? So I can lend to my customers and make a profit, okay? Or I can get a big bonus this year, right? Have a lot of parties, get a big bonus, get the bank bankrupt, and then just leave and go and live in the Bahamas, right? <laughs> One of those two reasons. Either I want to do that or make the bank profitable, okay? So anyway, I want to get funds. I want to get money. So I want to issue the bonds to the public. So first thing I'm going to do, contact the investment banker. Call the investment banker and say, can you serve as the manager of an underwriting syndicate that is going to bring the bonds to the market? Do you understand syndicate? Syndicate means like group. Okay. The underwriting syndicate is a group of investment banks, merchant banks and other banks that specialize in issuing bonds. We will have a lead manager who invites other managers to make a group. What do we do? Negotiate the terms with the borrower, ascertain the market condi conditions, and manage the issuance. So really investment bank is the middleman between the seller and the buyer. Okay? So they are going to serve as underwriters. So the Irish bank, actually they're going to sell their bonds to the underwriters. To underwrite something means write my name under that. Okay? Guarantee. Do you understand guarantee? like guaranteeing. So they act as underwriters. They will commit their own money to buy the issue from the borrowers at a discount from the issue price. So the underwriters, they use their own money and they give the money to the banks. So the banks already have their money, okay? The underwriters are sure they're going to be able to sell the bond later. That's why they do that, okay? It's like I'm a middleman. I'm, you sell me your car, right? You go to Suwon, second-hand car store, you sell me your car. I buy the car from you and give you cash. Why? I'm sure I can sell the car to somebody else later. Okay, that's underwriter. So the discount or underwriting spread is usually about 2 to 2.5%. Okay? 1% for domestic issues. That's a lot of money. So if Goldman Sachs, an investment bank, is selling the US government bond for $1 billion, and they make 1% on this transaction, just 1%, that's going to be $10 million just on that one transaction. Okay? Is that better than selling cars? How much percent? You can make a higher percent selling cars, right? The price you buy from me and the price you sell to her would be probably 40, 50% different, right? But bonds, maybe just 1% price I buy and the price I sell. But that's going to be a lot of money. That's why investment banking is profitable in industry. Okay? So then it becomes the underwriting, it's their responsibility to sell responsibility to sell to the public. Okay? Just like I sell my car to you, you're in the car company, it's not my responsibility anymore. It's your responsibility now to sell the car. The same for the underwriters. They buy the bond from the bank. It's now their responsibility to sell this uh, bond onto the public. Okay, so they are initially sold in a primary market. Okay, uh, the primary market usually works as an auction for bonds. The investment bank will invite some people to the auction. Okay. Put up your hand, how much will you pay for the bond? Okay? We'll sell the bond to the person who would pay the most money for the bond. Okay? 
So they organize an auction. You want to start the auction, Kyung Meg? Yes. So the secondary market then, after I buy the bond, do I have to keep it for 10 years and get my money back, or can I sell it to somebody else? What do you think? I can sell it to somebody else, right? Bond is just a piece of paper which says the company will repay this much money on this date and pay the coupon every year. So I can sell that back to some I can sell that paper to somebody else. That's called secondary market. Do you understand the difference between primary market and secondary market? Yes. Primary market, I buy. This is the primary market. The underwriter sells at an auction. Okay? Then after I buy at the auction, do I go back to the auction again? No. Try to sell back? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have bought it. I want to sell back at the auction. Let's start another auction. No, right? I sell on the secondary market. Okay, what is the secondary market? It's an over-the-counter market. It's not like the stock market. It's not an electronic exchange. Okay? Because stocks, everybody's buying and selling stocks. You can buy a stock for just $10. But can you buy a bond for $10? Is any company going to issue a bond for $10? No. No, bonds is $1 million, $1 billion, $500 million. So there are not that many people buying and selling bonds. Okay? So, for example, in London, you have somebody on the phone using the phone line to match the buyers and sellers. Okay? Like investment funds and so on on the secondary market. Okay? We don't have a kind of electronic exchange. This is called an over the counter market principle. Trading is done in London. We already saw London has a very good geographical position. It's open when Asia is open and the US is open, overlaps. Other uh, areas, Zurich, Luxembourg, Frankfurt, and Amsterdam. So the secondary market is market makers and brokers connected by telephones and computers. Okay, the market makers, they buy and sell bonds with bid and ask prices. Okay. Uh, like in the foreign exchange, we have bid and ask. So we need a clearing procedure for transferring ownership and payment. So we have... Uh, do you understand clearing? Clearing means just checking or administrating, in this case, administrating. So uh, you sell the bond to me over the phone, right? The bond is in the bank. I don't, I don't have the bank have the bond, so we have to have some system for transferring the ownership, okay? So we call these systems EuroClear and ClearStream International. So this is what happens. Each clearing system has a group of banks that store the bond certificates. So my bond is stored in a bank, okay? That bank is part of the clearing system. So. Members hold cash and bond accounts. When a transaction is conducted, electronic book entries are made that transfer the, bond, the book ownership of the bond certificate from the seller to the buyer and transfer the cash from the purchaser's account to the seller's account. The bond doesn't move. Okay? The bond is in the bank, in the safe. It stays in the bank. The bond doesn't move anywhere. Okay? Just the bank does the transaction. You make the cash and bond account in the bank, I make a cash and bond account in a bank, which is in the system, and they just transfer electronically the cash and the ownership of the bond. But we don't actually move the bond. Other functions of the clearing system, just like on the uh, currency trading platform, they provide credit. So we saw that you can get 90% margin on the, current, on the FX trading. Okay? So the current clearing system also gives a 90% uh, financing or credit. Okay, they help to distribute the new bonds, and the clearing system distributes the coupon payment. It deposits the coupon payment into your account. So just like the stock <coughs> market, we also have bond market indexes. Okay? JP Morgan and company makes bond indexes for different governments and different countries. Okay? They're used as, as uh, in the news. <clears throat> so 
do you have any question then about the bond markets? You can also buy the fund here, like this kind of fund for bonds. It's going to be going up 2% a year or 3% a year, right? Quite slowly. No questions about the bond market? Yes. So then discuss with your partner. Uh, we talked about, uh, I shouldn't have erased, but how does, how does the underwriting work? So discuss with your partner. So your company wants to sell a bond. You're working for the green company who wants to sell a bond. How are you going to sell a bond to the public? So discuss this process with your partner. You need to use an underwriter. Sell bonds. Who are you going to call? Don't know. Uh, e somehow. What's the first step you should do when you want your company wants to sell a bond? What kind of bank? Your local bank. Bank. 
begins with I, ends with T. <laughs> B, S, T, M, E, N in the middle. <laughs> Do you know? Very good. So we contact the investment bank. Okay? Step one. What are we going to do next? Or what are they going to do? What's going to happen next? So the investment banker will check about the company and the market. So they're going. Sometimes they tell the company, uh, "Your company is not developed enough to sell the bond yet, right?" Sometimes they tell the company, "Well, I think your company is very good, but the market is not good. These days there's a recession. I don't think you can find any customers." It's hard to find customers. It's going to be too expensive. Do you understand? Yes. So they, they'll check about the company in the market. Then what will they do next if everything is okay? If everything is okay, then what will happen next? Hmm? Yes, how? They will buy the bond from the company. What's that called? So how does that work? Do they buy just by themselves? Does the investment bank buy just by itself? No. Who does it buy with? Together. Usually they work in a group, right? Mm -hmm. Spreads out the risk among the different banks. Mm -hmm. So a group of investment banks will buy bonds from the company. Then what happens next? Sell so, so. so to the public. Right? How do they sell to the public? Do they put an ad in the newspaper? Add on the TV. No, they contact their contact their customers, customers, right? And inform them about an auction. Invite them to an auction. Are they going to contact you? No. So, for example, this works for governments too, right? Mm. If Ireland was after coming out of the IMF situation, right? Government has to decide when is a good time to start selling our bonds again. We don't want to sell, go to the auction and sell our bonds and nobody wants them, okay? So we watch the secondary market is one way. We watch the secondary market, we see in the secondary market the interest rate is coming down a lot on the Irish bond and then we decide, yes, we'll have an auction in the end, right? In the meantime, who's giving us the money? IMF, right? But eventually we can come out of the IMF program, we can start selling our bonds again at the auction. Okay. So, <coughs> this is the steps. Can we do this without the investment bank? Can we say, I don't want to pay the fee to the investment bank, that's too much, 1%. I just want to sell the bond myself. Do you think we could do that? It's going to be challenging to find the customers, right? Find the buyers. Okay, they're used to going through the investment bank, that system. So, this is the system which is uh, used by companies to borrow money on the bond market. Similar to the stock market, right? In the stock market, uh, instead of uh, making an auction selling to the public, they're going to sell to VIP clients, right? To their chosen clients first, and then their clients will sell on the secondary market which is the electronic exchange, okay? Primary market for stocks, banks will sell to the public, not they'll choose who they sell to, okay? They're very important clients. Then the very important clients will sell on the stock exchange, okay? In this case for the bonds, the price is decided by auction, okay? In the case of stocks, the price is decided by the investment bank. The investment bank decides what's a fair price for the stock price. <coughs> Discussing with the customer, discussing with the VIP, okay? They decide what's a fair price. <clears throat> so then, uh, that concludes our look at the bond, uh, international bond and equity market. So we're going to talk about the cost of capital internationally. 
So, who studied financial management last year? Last semester? When we talk about the cost of capital, what are we talking about? What does cost of capital mean for companies? What is it? How do we calculate the cost of capital? Cost of equity. What else? Cost of debt. What do we need to do? Subtract equity. So we the cost of equity is seven percent. Cost of minus cost of debt four percent. Our cost of capital is three percent. Is that correct? Is that correct? No. People are shaking their heads. Weighted average. We have to find a weighted average. You understand weighted average? We studied weighted average before, right? The weighted average of the cost of equity plus the cost of debt. So weighted average means I have 70% equity and equity costs 5%, right? 70% multiplied by 5. Plus cost of debt, 30% debt, right? And my debt plus 1%. A weighted average is going to be 0 0.7, okay? By 0. Point, sorry, 0, by 0 0.05, okay? Plus 0 0.3 0 .7. times 0 0.01, okay? This will tell me the cost of capital, okay? So my cost of equity is 5%, my cost of debt is 1%, I have 70% equity and 30% debt, okay? We do the calculation. So we're going to get uh, it's going to be 3.8 percent in the end, right? Something like that, right? Yes. So that will be my cost of capital. Uh, students who studied last semester, which is is it true or false? Cost of equity is always more expensive than cost of debt. True or false? Hands up, who thinks true? Cost of equity is always higher than cost of debt. Equity is always more expensive than debt. True. Hands up. Yes, false? Hmm? You need to go back and study again. Next semester. <laughs> Did I give you a passing grade? Yes. <laughs> okay. Short term memory is good, right? Longer term memory, not as good as short term memory. Guys, right? So why is equity always more expensive than debt? Risk, right? So if you're going to invest in the company we talked about, which do you prefer, to give a loan or, or invest in the stock price? Which is safer? Loan, right? With the stock equity, the price can go down. Your stock price can go down, right? So of course you're going to ask for a higher return. Okay? With the equity. With the debt, you're sure you can get 4%, right? You're sure, let's say, you can get 4% with debt. So the question is, if you're sure that you can get a yearly return of 4% with debt, how much extra would you ask for if I told you for a stock? How much more would you want to invest in the stock than 4%? Would you accept 4% also? 4% a year for investing in stock? So 4% I expect to get. The company is going to make 4% profit, right? A year. The company tells you we're going to make 4% profit, okay? Every year. But we'll pay you 4% if you give me a loan. Which are you going to prefer? Debt or equity? Debt, right? You're sure you'll get 4%. Company expects to make a 4% profit, but the price could go down if they make a loss. That's not sure. Is that sure? No. No. So my question is for you, how much profit do you want the company to make before you will invest in stock? 
10, right? You might say 10%. You want, if the company expects to make a 10% profit next year, right, and you expect the company to make a 10% profit next year, okay, then you can get 10% return. Then you'll invest in stuff. Okay? You have a risk, maybe the company won't make any profit, maybe like Volkswagen, they'll have a crisis and they'll make a loss, right? You don't have that risk for here. This is a sure 4%, okay? So that's the reason why equity is always more expensive than debt, okay? It's riskier. So investors are going to ask your company, you have to give me 10% return, okay? You have to give me a 10% return, then I'll invest in your company. If you don't make a 10% profit, I'll just give you a loan, or give a loan to another company, okay? So, <coughs> that's just a couple of basics that we're going to look at. So, uh, just before we finish, let's just uh, discuss this question with our partner. We already talked about it a little bit. What is the advantage? What are the advantages of international investment? So I'll just call the attendants while you're doing that. Kim Yera, Che Yun Sun, Kim Wei Min, Choi Jin Young, Kim Tae Kyun, Yun Sung Ho, Yip Yun Nam, Yi Jae Hak, Ju Kang Chan, Choi Young Jae, Kim Da Kyo. Yun Ju Wan, Hak Yeon Ju, Hak Jung Wan, Choi Jin Woo, Kim Sang Hee, Choi Tae Min, Yang Yeon Suk, Lee Sung Ho, Lee Chang Hee, Kim So Young. So. Yi Chang Hee, what do you think? I think the advantage is to is to invest heavily in world and risk diversification. So diversification of risk, right? For the investor, okay. So uh, we'll that also has an advantage for the company, right? If the investor diversifies their risk by investing abroad means the investor can have less risk by investing in another country. It means that the cost of capital can go down for the company too. The investor is prepared to accept 9%. They want 10% in their own country because it's higher risk. They already invest a lot in their own country. So if they invest in another country, they might accept 9%. So we get, investor gets the advantage, okay? Attractive investment opportunities, we're going to diversification benefit. We have more opportunities. If I invest in another country, I can invest in Amazon and Google, right? Gives me more opportunities, okay? So uh, then let's finish there for today. Thank you.